good morning, good afternoon, good evening for some of you all. I know, um, so just thank you for joining us. We're excited to have you all here today. Uh, my name is Robin Al Haddad, and I am the community manager for QualMe. That's IDEAL's qualitative monitoring and evaluation peer community. Um, and I'm happy to be welcoming you all here to our first event for 2023 um, on qualitative methods and tools for process monitoring. So this is a peer community and we would like to get to know each other really. And so we, so please introduce yourself. Go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. I see some people are going to do that now. Um, so put your name, your organization, the position where you're based um, and put all that into the chat. And we'll just give a minute. I also want to remind people of just a few basic house rules while we're in this event. Um, if you could mute your microphone when you are not speaking so that we don't hear background noises. If you could also use the chat box or you can raise your hand um, if you have a question and we will try to call on you. We'll try to get, uh, we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can in the short amount of time that we have here today. But if you do have a question, um, you can put it in the chat or use the raise your hand button. If you have the bandwidth and it allows you to turn on your video when you're speaking, please also do that when you're speaking so that we can kind of get to know each other a little bit and see everybody's faces. Um, we, were all, we are recording this session here today, so we will be sending out a link after the event um, of the recording. So you'll get all that later on. Also just want to let everybody know we do have these Qualme events. They're generally held about once a quarter. Um, so each meeting has a different topic of discussion. And today's meeting, we're going to focus on qualitative methods for tools and process monitoring. So um, this meeting is really just intended to give everybody a very brief overview and some insights into just a couple of really unique qualitative centric methods and tools that can be used during process monitoring activities. So I think we will put up the agenda slide and let you know that today we are going to hear from a couple of colleagues. Um, the first will be from International Advisory Products and Systems and that's IAPS and also Causal Design um, who are grantees of IDEAL's QPIA Small Grant Awards. So in September of 2019, with support from USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, IDEAL um, invited both emergency and development organizations to apply for a qualitative m and &E Program Improvement Award, that's QPIA. Um, and under that IDEAL Small Grant Program, implementers of both emergency and development food and nutrition security activities have had the opportunity to pilot innovative approaches document learning, develop tools, and pursue projects that will contribute to the improved design, implementation, and overall effectiveness of food and nutrition security programming. So we are super excited here today to have two grant awardees with us, and they're going to showcase their work. Um, after the plenary session, we will then break out into small groups for individual discussion. So we are a community of practice here. We want everybody to kind of get to know each other. We want to create a safe space for communication. So we really want to hear from everyone. It doesn't matter whether you are new to the field or you're a leading expert. We want to hear everybody's voices. Um, so we really encourage you to try and share your experiences, whether good or bad, in, in those breakout rooms and to try and get to know each other. So the first thing we want to do, um, just to get things rolling here, we're going to do a quick chat storm. Um, so we're going to start off with a question. And um, I want everybody to, you know, if you have an answer to that question, please put it in the chat. And let's see what kind of responses we get. So the question is, what examples of participatory action research or PAR research methods have you used in your research? So that could include participatory mapping, um, participatory videoing, most significant change stories. Um, there's lots of different types of participatory action research methods that people have used. Sometimes we hear it, um, it's also known as citizen science. 
that might be another term you've heard is citizen science. Um, so I just want to hear from everybody. What kind of methods have you used in your research? Have you used any PAR methods? Do you want to use PAR methods? All right, most significant change I see. Photo voice. <laughs> Hi, Bjorn. Outcome harvesting. Sure. Any others? Community market price data collection. Oh, very cool. I have to hear more of that. All right, well, now let's see how our first guest has used PAR methods in her work. We will now turn it over to our first presenter to share her experiences. First, I want to welcome Amina Ferrati from IAPS. We will hear from, more from Amina on how IAPS uses community-based participatory action research or PAR methods to inform outcome and process monitoring. So Amina serves as the president of the International Advisory Products and Systems, and that's IAPS. She is a woman-owned and managed consulting firm that leverages global expertise with local presence and transforms organizations and communities into partners of change. IAPS turns data into actionable knowledge and strength strengthens the capacity of organizations and communities through innovative solutions that enhance program impact and accountability. IAPS is a certified small business and an AA business. So now I'm going to hand it over to you, Amina. Thanks, uh, Robin, and thanks everyone for joining uh, today's discussion. I'm excited to present the results of a pilot of the photo voice approach as a form of participatory action research um, with this learning community. Uh, next slide. So for us at IAPS International Advisory Products and Systems, we designed the photo voice pilot um, with um, a lot of cooperation from our partners, as well as our staff members based globally at IAPS, as well as in Venezuela, in Syria, where we conducted the pilot approach, as well as the implementing partners. You'll note that we have masked the identities of the implementing partners that we worked with, as well as the participants in this project, in line with the standard procedures for BHA partners in Venezuela and Syria, given we are operating in such conflict and complex settings. Um, but I wanted to just start with a note of appreciation that the project would not have been possible without, of course, with the women who we engaged with, the participants of the program, the implementing partners who agreed to conduct this pilot with us, who provided guidance along the way, and the staff members who helped to design and shape the project. Next slide. So what is participatory action research? That might be a little bit different um, for many of us who are more familiar with the standard monitoring and evaluation approaches. Participatory action research, or PAR as I'll call it, is a little bit different from traditional research, which is more extractive. It's not a new approach. It's been around since about the 1940s. The important thing about PAR is that it's a type of approach of research rather than the method itself. As we saw in the questions posed in the chat just now, there are many types of ways of having participants lead and shape forms of monitoring, inquiry, or research. The idea of PAR is to ground the lines of inquiry or monitoring in the lived experiences of people by working with them rather than simply studying them. By doing so, our goal is to see the world or a particular humanitarian project, assistance, or activity in a new light. Some of the key elements of PAR is that there's a cyclical approach. So the monitoring or the research is designed with the participants by being directly involved with them. 
there's an action or implementation time, and then there's the reflection and learning cycle so that the views of participants are built in and embedded in the monitoring throughout the entire process. Again, the central point here is to really involve community in the research and not simply have them be the subject of the research. And in that way, PAR offers something a little bit different than standard monitoring and evaluation approaches in that embedded in the concept of PAR is the shifting of power. So again, including communities or participants in a very meaningful way to determine what the research or monitoring looks like and what are the outcomes from it. Next slide. So for us at IAPS, when we received the qualitative monitoring grant from IDEAL, we were excited to use PhotoVoice as a form of participatory action research. PhotoVoice is also not very new. It's been around since the 1990s, and it was originally created to promote creative expression and social change and linking those two components. The basic idea of photo voice is to identify, represent, and improve communities through taking and sharing of photos. It's been used globally and in the United States with vulnerable populations in many settings. However, there's been a more recent interest in using it in humanitarian space, and in particular in food security or wash areas. I'll note that there have been some recent really helpful materials produced by ProWash on Photo Voice that are also available on the FSN network that offer some ideas of how this type of monitoring can be used. We were really interested to see would it be applicable in a complex setting um, and how might that how might that look and what findings might result from that. So again, in photo voice, the simplest idea or way to describe it is that photos serve as a prompt to stimulate discussion, develop critical thinking, and encourage listening to peers, but at the same time, bridging a gap between community and decision makers. So in photo voice, the participants or the beneficiaries of a project themselves are the ones who take photos, decide what to take photos of, and decide when, whom, and how to share those photos with decision makers. Next slide. Why photo voice? So for us, we wanted to look at the qualitative approaches in line with the goals of, the, of this grant that could offer new insights into um, activity or process monitoring or outcome monitoring. Um, we decided to use photo voice, as I said, on the idea that we would center the views and the perspectives of participants. In this way, we would look to see if the methodology was feasible. Could it be used as a form of monitoring in a non-permissive setting or a complex setting like Syria or Venezuela, where BHA activities are being funded? And could an implementing partner or a research partner working with an implementing partner try to replicate and do this again? We also wanted to see if we would be able to add to the toolkit of qualitative monitoring approaches, such as could photo voice be used alongside traditional approaches like key informant interviews or focus group discussions by offering another option that is perhaps more participant centered. Our second goal of the project was to see if the women, the population that we limited this pilot with, could be empowered as participants in photo voice. So that is in line with offering an alternative to the more extractive research methods. We wanted to see if we could support the engagement of participants in the design of the process, impl implementation, and in what information, data, or results might come out of it. Our ultimate goal was to see if the information that could be gleaned from photo voice, which in this case would be photos as well as, um, as, well as uh, themes or feedback about a project, could be used to ultimately improve the assistance or see if it's uh, functioning as it should be. Next slide. There are many different ways to implement photo voice. And for us at IOPS, our teams conducted a detailed desk review to create some key steps of how we were going to pilot the approach and how we were going to be both really flexible 
in given the areas where we decided to work, which were Syria and Venezuela, and very adaptive to the operating context. Um, the next few slides will go through some of the basic points about the methodology. I'll note that we will be producing a full issue brief and a facilitator guide that will be published on the FSN network um, in the next few weeks or months. So we're really excited to offer that methodology to everyone. But the basic function that we, that we identified is to select the locations. As I noted, we selected Syria and Venezuela because there are two complex settings where IOPS already works. We had strong partnerships with implementing partners in the region, and we also had a very strong local network of staff members. So that meant we understood the safety and security precautions and the operational challenges that might be present. And in line with the objectives of the research, we wanted to see if photo voice could be used in those types of settings where sometimes doing monitoring and evaluation can be incredibly difficult. We started by having conversations with several implementing partners in which we ultimately decided to work with one IP in each location. Again, I'm not disclosing their identity in line with the, um, with the standard protocols that are applied in these areas. But we did have several conversations in which we ultimately created a memorandum of understanding so we could explain how IOPS was incurring the cost for photo voice. The role of the implementing partner was to help advise, to support us in contacting their participants and in understanding their program and being able to provide the feedback and learning that would result from it. We conducted risk assessments um, initially and ongoing throughout the project so we could determine how we might best be able to adapt photo voice. And ultimately, we selected about 30 women participants in each location, uh, in each country rather, and about two to three communities in each, in each country. Next slide. The second step we needed to do, which is really important, um, and we'll talk about that later in this presentation in terms of findings, but to recruit and train local facilitators and develop um, very flexible but detailed training materials. So just as in this conversation today, PAR um, and participant-led uh, uh, monitoring approaches are not always as commonly used or understood. And so we needed to be very flexible when adapting the project um, to that lack of knowledge sometimes. What we did was we wanted to build the capacity of local facilitators. So we wanted to hire people to help manage the project at the community level who look like the community members themselves. So that meant we largely prioritized hiring women who were from the same or similar geographic areas. They were native um, language speakers. So that meant they were fluent in Spanish or Arabic um, and they were country nationals. We also prioritize their lived experience over um, formal education, for example. So while all had some level of education, we wanted to really make sure they could be flexible and adaptive to talking and building a rapport with community members that they would be engaging and managing the project with. Because again, this is a form of participant-led um, methodology. And we also had to conduct um, detailed training. So we really wanted to build the capacity of the facilitators to help them understand how to manage a project. And we did that over several trainings. Next step, uh, next slide. The next thing is we needed to select and train the photo voice participants. So we did this through, again, a lot of coordination with the implementing partner to understand the profile of their beneficiaries or participants and to agree on the exact projects in which we might um, purposefully select participants from. In Syria, that was a um, food security um, activity involving the delivery of home vegetable gardens. And in Venezuela, this was a um, both food security and wash activity um, involving um, a food basket delivery by the implementing partner there. So we worked with the implementing partner to review their um, participant list and we purposefully selected um, prioritizing women first uh, um, as the primary focus, and then second, um, making an initial assessment by requesting if they were interested and were giving consent to be considered for the project. 
Um, we then developed and implemented a detailed training with the participants after we gained their consent and developed the groups. And this was led by the local facilitator. So again, why developing um, really detailed training curriculum in their native languages was really important. Um, we were also very concerned at the onset, I will say, about limiting participants' time because we were not um, financially um, uh, providing them any assistance um, as a result of participating in Photo Voice. So this was on a volunteer basis. And as a result, we wanted to be very mindful of that. But we did have some interesting findings that came out um, that actually showed that um, I think our being mindful of this in the beginning was a good thing and participants actually really valued um, uh, working on the project. Next slide. And then of course we wanted to implement photo voice. So what does that mean? It means that we agreed on weekly or bi-weekly times to meet, where to meet, such as a, um, uh, a neighboring community area, or um, at times in Syria, the facilitator would go door to door to the participants' homes because it was not safe for the participants to meet as a group given it was an active conflict setting. And in those times, the facilitator served really to guide the conversation, to reflect and look at the photos that were being shared um, and to agree on initial themes. Um, in terms of practical and operational issues, um, what we what worked for us was to use uh, restricted WhatsApp channels in both Syria and Venezuela to share the photos um, amongst the participant groups and with the facilitators, because that's what's commonly used in those areas. And then at the end, um, we agreed to discuss um, how they might share the photos with them, uh, which I'll move on to the next slide. Um, which was mainly who they wanted to share the photos with. So in these, um, in both locations, the participants largely identified the implementing partner. They identified that, of course, as the partner providing the underlying assistance. So for them, that was the um, immediate and obvious audience to share the results of their photos with. And what we did end up doing was hosting a series of stakeholder presentations um, in which the implementing partners sat in the same room with many of the women participants, and they um, shared uh, pictures that were printed, that were taped onto, onto the wall, and it sparked discussions and feedback about the assistance that they were being given, about the role the assistance plays in their lives, and what it meant for them. I'll note, and we talk about this extensively in the reports that will be published, that during the entire process, we wanted to be very mindful of the safety and security of everybody involved in photo voice. So from our facilitators, the participants themselves, and the implementing partner. That meant that we were very nimble and flexible. So as I mentioned in Syria, the group initially were meeting every other week together um, at a single location, but that, um, Due to the onset of active conflict in their community, they ended up having uh, facilitators go door to door. Um, in Venezuela, for example, there were um, practical challenges about having beneficiaries access a common meeting point. Um, and so we had to be flexible in saying, okay, this meeting point isn't working for us, let's revise it. So just some basic operational um, uh, pieces had to be changed to be mindful of what was working for participants. Next slide. So here you can see some of the several challenges and operating context that we were being um, considerate of. And like we said, in Venezuela, we were thinking um, this is a politically and economically complex setting. And so we had to be very sensitive of the identity that this funding is from the US government um, and creating various levels of confidentiality and masking the identity of the donor in addition um, to the implementing partner. Um, we also had to be very sensitive about crime and petty theft um, and thinking about our operating protocols. And one of the ways we managed that was really making sure that we hired local facilitators who understood the communities where they were working in. That was a very similar approach in Syria in which we had to have a lot of operational flexibility in terms of how often we were going to meet, as I mentioned, with the participants. Next slide. 
So what were the outcomes? What did we learn from doing photo voice? What we learned is that photo voice is a practical approach. And in Syria, we got a lot of insight into an area that has very strict gender norms in which the role of women is not very public. And what we were able to see was um, through the photos that were taken, the women called it rural women in agriculture. And they were able to show the products of the home vegetable garden kits that they received and what it meant for them. And it really sparked several discussions. Next slide. In Venezuela, we had a little bit of a different context in which that area has less restrictive gender norms, but as I said, it's a political and economically complex setting. Here, one of the key outcomes of the project is the women in one of the locations in Venezuela created a cookbook. They wanted to highlight what they were doing in their homes and how they were feeding their families nutritious foods using the products that were contained in the food basket provided by the implementing partner. They also were able to reflect on how they were able to use the money that they saved um, from not having to um, buy the food on other means, such as buying things that they needed for their households or their children. So again, really reflecting on what the, what the assistance meant for them. In both locations, what stuck out to us as a really key finding is we sparked discussions amongst the women Benef uh, the women participants in both locations amongst themselves. In Sierra, there were discussions about the bounty of their crops and how one woman was growing really large eggplants and what that meant and what she might be doing differently compared to others. In Venezuela, like we said, the women agreed to create these recipes. And again, it's very participant led. The idea was directed to them. In both locations, a key outcome in our conversations with the women participants was that this project really gave them value. Next slide. And that's what we can see in some of the findings and the lessons that I'll close with, which is that the big lesson that we learned is photo voice is still new. It does require extensive training and adapting, but it's, it is feasible. It can be done in a complex setting. And that even though we were very concerned about the amount of time that would be required from participants, they can be empowered in their participation and there is value in sparking collaboration between participants and implementing partners and allowing participants to decide what they want to share with an implementing partner as a way of providing routine monitoring. So I know I'm running a little bit over, I will close with that and um, turn it back over. Thank you. Thank you, Amina. Um, first, I just want to quickly apologize to everybody. I know I've heard that there were some issues with the Zoom link of uh, people not being able to get into the Zoom. So I just want to apologize for that. I think we're working on it, trying to get it fixed. Um, but anyway, um, thank you, Amina, for giving us that intro into PAR methodologies in general and also into the IAPS's uh, photo voice methods. Um, one thing I kind of like about photo voice to me that it um, seems more inclusive in the sense that um, participants don't necessarily have to be literate to be involved. Um, they can take photos and photos kind of speak for themselves. So um, that's great. I, I really like that. Um, you know, it can be more inclusive. Um, also, thanks, Amina, for reminding us that you all are putting out a facilitator's guide. So just to let everybody know, we will send out that facilitator's guide um, and maybe also the cookbook, which is really amazing. Um, you know, so we'll send it out after the event once it's actually ready for publication. Um, does anybody have any questions for Amina? P please feel free to either put your questions into the chat box or you can just use the raise your hand function and we will try and call on you. I'll just give a minute and see if anybody has any questions.
All right. Okay. Uh, uh, I would like to ask you a question since I was 10 minutes uh, late joining this because of the in, in, uh, link issue. So I have one question to learn more about this. I, I, found, I found this very interesting as a new resource methodology. But uh, my question is that should we interpret, the, interpret that in our report, uh, the photo we have as uh, evidence of uh, like program success or things. So should we interpret that in our report, uh, in the in the resource report that we have collected uh, as a evidence of uh, program success or wh how can we use this information is that? That is it, thanks. Sure, uh, I can answer that. Um, so for us, I think like any monitoring and evaluation approach, we can't use it on its own or um, to exclusion of other areas. So I think there's really value, obviously, in quantitative and qualitative approaches. And um, what we found interesting is that photo voice can be used as a form of qualitative monitoring alongside traditional approaches and offer something, an additional data point, perhaps that when an implementing partner is doing its reporting can be triangulated against other data. So you might, for example, have done a beneficiary survey and gotten, let's say, good or bad feedback about an activity. You can present the photographs that may have been taken from a photo voice if you use that, for example, as routine monitoring alongside that, that can confirm or deny and offer an additional data point. So we see it as part of an overall toolbox or monitoring and evaluation approach and not something that maybe might necessarily be left on its own. Okay, okay great, that is useful, thank you. I see we also have a question in the chat box, Amina. Um, given a lot of training that seems to be necessary for photo voice, is it really worth it as opposed to standard m and &E tools that most local organizations are, are already familiar with? Beyond the the fact that, of course, this methodology is very interesting overall. Um, yeah, so that's another good point. You know, I know that with traditional focus groups, um, generally you're kind of meeting one off or maybe, you know, twice you'll meet with a group, but with photo voice, you do have to meet, um, you know, a little bit more often. Um, people or participants are meeting, what, weekly, I believe. So how, how does that, um, is it, in, in the overall, is photo voice you see is better or works with, you know, traditional m and &E tools? Yeah. So um, I will, I'm trained as a lawyer, so I'll never give a direct answer, um, but I'll say that it really depends. But I think the short answer for us that we learn is it definitely works alongside um, a routine monitoring. So I think there's a couple considerations and we're thinking about both the perspective of the implementing partner or the researchers, as well as the participants themselves. So any approach requires training in the specific tools, in the activity, in the methodology, and in the operating context. And so photo voice in that sense is no different. The beauty of photo voice is the simplicity. You are taking photos, you're asking participants to reflect on them, and you're creating some method in which they can share the results. That is really the basic methodology. We, of course, are researchers, so we're making it far more complex by just describing the various steps. But the simplicity, I think, is what has some value for the implementing partner and for the participant. At the same time, there are definitely trade-offs. Um, this is something that is going to go for a longer period of time. So I know some someone mentioned in the questions, how long did we do this for? We implemented the actual photo voice meetings over about a two, two and a half month um, basis with some flexibility between the locations based on when groups were kind of developing that group cohesion. Um, and so I think, you know, if we think about the benefits, which is very different, perhaps in a focus group discussion, where you extract the information from your participants, but in photo voice, we have a collaboration between the implementing partner and the participants themselves. And so I think that depending on the setting and the project, that can have some value. All right, great. We'll have, we have one more question and then we'll have to move to our next uh, guest speaker. So how would you describe the advantages of photo voice approach in comparison to traditional ones? That looks like in the chat, we have a question from jo Giovanna. 
Sure. Um, so for us, as I was just um, saying, I think the interesting thing was this um, collaboration and nexus between the participants and the implementing partner. Um, there was a lot of, I think, buy-in with the implementing partner, their work, their perspective, and the underlying assistance that they were being given, which is a little bit different than simply providing assistance and asking for their feedback. Instead, it's done in a way that is far more engaging and can be, can be if the implementing partner or research decides it to be uh, longer term with the participant. It can also be done shorter. So there's a lot, I think that's the beauty of photo voice and one of the benefits. It's a very flexible approach that can be highly adapted. Great, thank you, Amina. Um, unfortunately, I know we have a few more questions, but we're gonna have to move on to our next speaker. But um, we will be getting into our breakout groups. And if people are in that group with you, they can obviously ask you questions in the breakout room. Um, so let's go ahead and see now how our next partner has gained insights into how the role of local governance actors and community dynamics can impact food, food security outcomes. So our next presenters are Portia Hunt and Sophie Turnbull from Causal Design who will be presenting on how they gain insights into local community dynamics, including the role of informal and local governance actors to inform food security programming activities. So we have first, Sophie Turnbull is a monitoring and evaluation research and learning specialist at Causal Design. She has managed and con contributed to a range of qualitative and mixed method projects in the international development and humanitarian fields, covering a range of sectors. Her experience spans countries across Africa, Central and Southeast Asia, and she has extensive experience collecting and supervising qualitative data collection in the field, both remotely and in person, as well as coding and analyzing qualitative data, both manually and using a variety of software programs. We also have with us here today, Portia Hunt, who is the Senior Monitoring and Evaluation Research and Learning Manager at Causal Designs. She is a mixed method researcher in the field of international devel development, economics, and has led studies and projects in Southeast Asia, Latin America, the MENA region, and Sub-Saharan Africa, chiefly on the subjects of inclusive economics, growth, and gender trafficking of persons and private sector, de private sector development. Um, as Sophie and Portia are both presenting, feel free to write your questions in the chat box. Um, they'll have an opportunity to answer your questions after their presentation. So now I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Portia and Sophie. Thanks for that, Robin. Um, and yeah, thanks everyone for joining the call. I'll be starting um, with the first half of our presentation, which talks a bit more about uh, the kind of purpose of this of um, this grant and this module that we were creating. Um, and then Portia will take over with some more of the kind of findings and lessons learned um, that we had. So could we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so yeah, just to begin, uh, this is what our kind of presentation is gonna cover today. So we got a grant as causal design under the QPA award to develop um, what we're calling a qualitative monitoring module as a way to kind of bridge the gap between qualitative and quantitative um, data collection efforts. Um, so first we'll kind of explain the purpose of the award that we received um, and you know the way it kind of you know aimed to sort of bridge this gap between qualitative and quantitative and sort of leverage the strengths of both approaches. And then we'll explain how we piloted the module, which was a large part of our award, was obviously testing this module and seeing if uh, seeing if our uh, attempts were successful and our way our ways of doing it would actually work um, and get some lessons learned from that for um, kind of future deployment and also modifications to the module as necessary. Um, and yeah, those Porsche will will explain more about. So I think to start, I'd like to kind of explain a bit about uh, you know the situation that the kind of problem we had and the solution we're sort of proposing to solve. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So to kind of start at a really basic level, our award kind of set out to find a solution to this problem. And it's well established that food insecurity is a sort of multifaceted, very complicated problem with many causes, many contributors, and a lot of things, and a lot, a lot of factors that can um, influence it. Um, and many of these are beyond the control of projects uh, or other kind of actors seeking to address issues related to food security. 
So one of the many factors that can that can affect food uh, security is um, what we've called community level governance and informal institutions, which is kind of defined in a very broad anthropological way as the norms, customs, and traditional organizations that shape and influence daily life. So, you know, I think these are inherently unique, very context specific phenomena, um, and very much more on the kind of social side, anthropology, anthropolo anthropological side, um, touching on issues like society structure, power dynamics, um, you know, this word culture, rather than kind of more straightforward um, economics and problems of kind of cause and effect. So as a result, um, this kind of, these sort of phenomena lend themselves much more to a qualitative than a quantitative inquiry. But as I'm sure uh, many of us have kind of experienced in our work, um, even if programs are kind of complexity aware and want to incorporate these factors into, you know, their implementation plans or their theories of change, there's not always um, the funds, the time, the appetite to uh, conduct detailed ethnographies or sort of uh, in-depth qualitative um, inquiries. So there's this there's this kind of um, you know balance and risk that these uh, factors, which can you know completely upend development programs and food security programs, do risk end up being overlooked. Um, so can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So our kind of proposed solution um, to this uh, using the QPI grant was to find a way to incorporate a, a sort of qualitative investigation into more traditional quantitative efforts by creating a qualitative module as in like a survey module, a set of qualitative questions that could be integrated into qualitative surveys um, with the idea that this would be uh, more cost effective as it could be incorporated into sort of pre-existing planned and already budgeted for regular surveys that are often part of um, development of food security interventions. Um, and the aim would be that these qualitative questions and this qualitative module would be able to provide data to implementers about local governance and informal institutional dynamics that could um, prove useful to implementers, either for uh, you know, tweaking program implementation to enhance program outcomes, um, inform theories of change, and just provide um, details about the context uh, in general. So with, the, with that sort of broad purpose um, stated, could we move to the next slide, please? And this, um, yeah, this slide shows our kind of four-step process uh, under the award to kind of, you know, create this module, test it, and, and refine it. So first of all, we conducted an in-depth literature and program document review in order to develop a sort of beta version of the qualitative module. Um, so the module consisted of, it was sort of formatted in such a way that it could be added to um, typical survey softwares, such as Survey CTO. Um, Kobo and things like that, but they, they're framed as open-ended qualitative questions, and then the idea would be that um, the answers would be recorded with the participants' permission, of course, um, and then that data would be transcribed and um, analyzed later in, you know, using coding software. So um, the beta version of the module that we developed had five sub-themes, um, which, sorry, they're not actually listed on the slide, uh, but those were legitimacy and credibility, trust and social capital, governance, resource and food sharing, and COVID-19, because um, at the time that we were rolling this out, COVID-19 was added on as an additional, very significant contextual factor that was affecting um, development programming in general. And also as part of this initial development stage, we also created an a priori codebook. Um, so a priori being a sort of in deductively uh, deductive codebook that would serve as a starting place um, for the analysis once the module was piloted and we had some test data in. So our second stage after creating the after creating the module was to pilot it. And we piloted it along with alongside two surveys um, in order to kind of pro provide recommendations for changes to the module itself and also the kind of deployment um, processes. So um, the main purpose of the piloting was to kind of identify gaps. Um, both, you know, through the kind of analysis of the data and, and a look at the data, but also through um, hearing back directly from the enumerators who collected the data to hear um, more on their more on their experience of using this tool in the field. And then step three, revisions and lessons learned, was basically about taking everything that we learned from the piloting and, you know, updating the module to reflect those revisions um, and creating some uh, some other deliverables um, for for the ideal team about what we've learned and how we plan to kind of incorporate them in the future. 
And the last step um, being knowledge sharing and dissemination is the step we're at now. So having piloted the module, having got our lessons learned, we're now um, sharing the findings of, of the module itself and the piloting and the sort of lessons learned for its future development in the hope that um, this module can be kind of rolled out um, or be made useful for others in this in this space. So could, could we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So a bit more details about um, our actual piloting process. So the module was deployed alongside two broader quantitative surveys that Causal Design was doing in Malawi and in Ethiopia. So it was literally uh, added as a survey module into the respective surveys that were being done in this um, in these two settings using each, uh, they each had two different um, survey uh, softwares. Um, and as noted, you know, the reason this was kind of formatted as a module was exactly for this purpose, to see how it could be kind of, how, how far it would be possible to integrate the sort of qualitative questioning and qualitative inquiry alongside surveys to kind of make a more streamlined effect and get the best of both worlds um, from one sort of data collection effort. So the two surveys that um, were piloted in, the one in Malawi was, they were both actually uh, funded by the US government and both focused on uh, food security outcomes. Uh, in Ethiopia, it was a baseline survey, and in Malawi, it was part of a regular monthly data collection effort. So in total, we had 110 randomly sampled uh, respondents, uh, 60 from Malawi and 50 from Ethiopia. And also touch on um, enumerated training here, because this was one of the things that um, was a challenge for us, partially because of COVID. So because the piloting was done during COVID, it wasn't possible for us to conduct in-person trainings in both contexts. So in Malawi, it was possible because we have staff in Malawi. So um, enumerated training was done by some of our uh, Malawi-based causal design staff. The training lasted a day. And um, in both cases, the, the training kind of covered um, a review of qualitative methods, as well as this kind of specific data collection goals and questions in this module in particular. Um, and with an emphasis on kind of making sure that translations were clear and appropriate, and also that questions were well understood by enumerators. Um, and in Ethiopia, given that we couldn't travel there because of COVID, uh, we had to follow a kind of remote training of trainers model. So um, causal design trained the team leads in Ethiopia, and then those team leads would then conduct the training for the qualitative enumerators in person. So now I'll hand over to Portia to talk a bit more about um, our actual findings and the recommendations that the pilot and lead. Thanks, Sophie. Hi, I'm Portia. Um, so the focus of our presentation um, is on the module. So it's more about the how than the what. But of course, we want to impart some of what we found um, just as an example of what kind of important intel you can gather using this module. Um, so respondents did shed some light on the interplay between informal institutions and the formal visible ones. For example, uh, in both Malawi and Ethiopia, interactions between uh, trusted community leaders, which are referred to as chiefs in this context, and NGOs often determine how resources and benefits are distributed, um, at least as described by uh, respondents. This points to uh, these chiefs, these village leaders as a key component um, of how a food security intervention could sink or swim, essentially. Uh, respondents also described uh, a range of context-specific food and resource sharing customs, which have ramifications for, for example, targeting of interventions. In a context with a high degree of food sharing and distribution, your targeting plans may completely go out the window. Uh, so, also, crucially, if we stay unaware of these informal arrangements, we can end up bringing about some negative externalities, uh, creating tensions or undermining um, these unseen social structures. So that points to the, um, the value of including this in our food security program and, uh, programming and research. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, uh, so... Lessons learned and recommendations. Um, as Sophie pointed out, uh, the approach was uh, in this piloting phase, we essentially gave survey enumerators a crash course in qualitative inquiry, not because that's the best way to get really rich qualitative data, but because that is realistically how this is going to be deployed. Uh, we wanted to see how easily we could 
incorporate the module into uh, regular survey data collection, uh, which of course led to some, some enumerators um, not super duper following up on vague answers or probing as one would do um, if you were used to collecting qualitative data and doing interviews. So that was uh, one lesson learned. Um, people who are used to, uh, to enumerating surveys may just need a little more, um, a little more extensive training on how to get the most out of this module. Uh, as for responsiveness, okay, so there, um, especially in Ethiopia, there was a lot of discomfort uh, talking about some informal and formal institutions given the, the conflict context. Um, and so when you are doing, asking these kind of potentially sensitive questions there, uh, really need a good plan as to how to make sure people feel safe answering your questions. Uh, and one thing that didn't help in a lot of cases was the audio recording component. That made a lot of people very uncomfortable. Uh, and so if at all possible, one thing you could do if you anticipate that that could be a problem is having a note taker uh, with, the, um, with the enumerator so that they can take notes instead of doing an audio recording, if that's feasible. Um, Another thing that popped up was uh, some of the topics were just not completely relatable uh, or well understood by all the respondents, which points to a need for, um, in addition to enumerator training, uh, just some like uh, maybe a focus group discussion or something to make sure that the terminology you're using uh, is well understood and the questions themselves are tailored and relevant to that specific context. For example, in some places in Malawi, um, people were not sure what an NGO was. They thought it might be private companies. Uh, so before you jump in with these questions, making sure that the terminology and, and, and um, the questions that you're using are, are gonna be appropriate for that context. Um, and in another case, they used an unfamiliar um, term for COVID-19, and that compromised how people were able to answer questions um, having to do with the pandemic, simply because that wasn't the word that they use. Um, so survey length. So more about uh, real world implications. Uh, this is meant to be tacked on to um, routine survey data collection, which means you have the potential for a lot of respondent fatigue. Uh, so if, and so in one case, people had just done a survey with us. Um, and in another case, they, it was a baseline survey, but it was pretty long. So by the end of all that, not everybody was thrilled about going into detail about um, some of these uh, societal nuances. So uh, another thing that we might consider doing in the future is uh, maybe instead of randomly targeting, um, or um, or asking people uh, all the questions in the module, maybe doing a little planning in advance to say like, okay, which groups, which demographics or which specific modules are most important for us to ask, maybe rotate those um, and not ask everything of everyone. Um, and so just picking your battle um, in that context could also get you more of what you're looking for without exhausting everyone. And um, that's that's the long and short of it. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Guidance for future deployment. Uh, okay, we've talked about most of this. Um, deployment timing and frequency, making sure that people aren't exhausted by all your questions. Um, training to make sure that your uh, survey enumerators are also comfortable with qualitative inquiry. Um, and uh, for piloting, yes, advise revisions for length, approachability, and sensitivity. So that has to do with making people comfortable answering your questions um, and, and also um, maybe picking and choosing uh, who uh, answers which module questions instead of just giving them to everyone. 
Um, and then recording versus note taking, we talked about how the audio recording, um, despite very reassuring language in the informed consent, made some people very uncomfortable. So in those cases, um, having the option of a note taker instead of an audio recording might get you more of what you need. Next slide. <laughs> Can I have the next slide? That's the end of the slides. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you, Sophie and Portia, for sharing about the QMM module and how it helps get causal designs more realistic depiction of their operating environments and local gov governance contexts. Um, does anybody have any questions for Sophie and Portia? I will give it a minute, see if anybody has any questions. Um, I know we're a little over time. Feel free to raise your hand or put questions in the chat box. Maybe I'll just ask a quick question. Um, so Sophie and Portia, given the sensitivity and political climate, particularly like in Ethiopia, uh, I know that questions around the governance can be a very sensitive topic. Um, you know, it, it may elicit like powerful responses from people like fear and anxiety. So, um, or they might feel like they're kind of questioning authority. So I'm just wondering how how did you create that environment where participants felt comfortable to share their experiences and and kind of trust the enumerators? Um, if you could maybe elaborate a little bit on that. Sure. Um, I mean, yeah, it was something that I mean it was kind of prominent for our because the whole context of Ethiopia was obviously in you know with, there was conflict, but we were in um, the Amhara region, so not too much of a kind of you know like hotbed. But um, I think something we really emphasized in the enumerator trainings, which you know almost kind of went too far, was um, that we really encourage enumerators not to, you know, to emphasize to respondents that you know their participation in this survey at all is completely voluntary. They don't have to respond to anything that they don't feel comfortable with, um, and feel free to to you know not respond um, to anything that they that they don't kind of feel particularly comfortable responding with. But as a result, I think that. Um, a lot of people, you know, refused to, to answer questions um, like that because, you know, even if they would have been, you know, slightly willing, um, they didn't want to say anything else. So one of our kind of key takeaways was that we really need to um, have a bit of have a bit more piloting to really in each context, because I think, you know, we didn't have such issues in Malawi, for example. Um, so we need to really, you know, for this module to work as as well as it as it could. Um, have slightly more piloting in the field to kind of really make sure that any particularly problematic questions are modified, um, that, you know, terminology is clarified maybe, um, and, and as well as Portia mentioned, the kind of recording factor. And something that we that we thought about asking was also changing questions to, to make them less sensitive, to kind of frame them as more kind of rhetorical questions. So, um, you know, say like, you know, has anyone, had, has anyone in your community ever experienced, you know, X, Y, Z? as opposed to, you know, more direct questions. And you'd be like, you know, in a hypothetical situation of, you know, like this and this happening, what would be the places where people might turn to for help? You know, what would be the, why would they go to these sources? You know, why wouldn't they go to the other sources? Um, so things like that. Okay, great. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's great um, to try, kind of change it to a hypothetical question rather than a direct question. It makes people more comfortable. All right, um, is, are there any other questions that we have for Sophie and Portia? I'm not seeing anything in the chat at the moment. So we will probably just go ahead and move on. Okay. Um, so now we're going to take about 30 minutes and go into a small group breakout groups. Um, so we welcome you to please share your own examples in the breakout rooms. And we will report, do a quick report out after the discussion. Um, we're hoping that this meeting will give you a chance to make connections with others and take the conversation further. So please, um, you know, try and, and um, talk to each other a bit in the in the rooms. You will be randomly assigned to a breakout room, and a message will pop up letting you know which group you're you're going to be in. 
and you will need to click on join the group. So um, in our groups, we're going to try and have four groups. Um, we're going to have four rooms. So room one and room three, the odd numbers, you all will talk about the local governance and informal institutions. So the question will be, how have local governance and informal institutions affect development programming and outcomes in your work? Um, so that's question number one, and that will be room one and room three. Then we have the even numbers, room two and room four, you will talk about um, the photo voice. So given what you have heard about photo voice as a form of partic participant led research, do you see this as being an, an any interest in piloting this method in your research or as an implementing partner? What adaptations do you think you would have to make to make photo voice work? So we have those two questions um, in our breakout rooms. And okay, we'll see you here back in about 30 minutes. Sophie and Karen, group number one, if you all could give us a quick report out on what you discussed. Yeah, thanks, Robin. Sure. And thanks to Sophie for facilitating in the group. Um, I think we had a, an in-depth conversation that we could have carried on a bit longer. I'll just share a couple of the key highlights. Um, one, one comment had to do with, um, or one question really was, um, a point how we could integrate the governance module, not just into routine monitoring, but as an assessment tool up front to give us a better sense of the landscape um, in which we're operating um, and how it can be useful in the, in the project design component, um, as well as to give us some insights for some deeper um, qualitative inquiry as really the outcome of the, the governance module is sort of higher level insights. Um, another uh, topic that we spent some time on was how this uh, QMM could be well integrated with a stakeholder analysis up front um, so that we can really identify the formal and informal institutions and actors um, and how important that is as those stakeholders intersect and have a uh, have, you know, potentially a very strong impact um, on the interventions that we're trying to implement and our overall project goal. But it, it's important that um, our local stakeholders understand um, the activities that we're working to implement and that stakeholder out analysis combined with the QMM may be um, a, a way to address that. Um, a third topic was um, just to the extent that the QMM is a quantitative or there's a qualitative open-ended module that's integrated into a quantitative tool, um, just that there's a different skill set or really a different way of thinking when you're doing quantitative and qualitative data collection. Um, I think Sophie referred to um, what they call sort of the spirit of the tool. And so, you know, rather than the word for word, question by question, quantitative approach, how important it is for our researchers to really understand um, the, the essence of the information that we're trying to get at and have some ownership and engagement over that. Um, some ways to get there um, we discussed include um, more time for training, uh, more time for piloting and you know, role play and practice with real time feedback. Um, training also for data entry being very important um, and note taking. Um, and then uh, one interesting idea is to make time for really co creating um, the qualitative tool um, such that the questions that are being asked, there's more ownership on the part of, of the researchers who are collecting data and more ability to kind of move from question to question, more facility with that. So, uh, Team, anything you'd like to add or clarify? Nothing for me. Thanks for thanks for that very succinct um, summary. Okay. Well, thanks, group. Over to you, Robin. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I definitely. There's I there's a difference thinking between qualitative and quantitative data data collection. So yes, piloting and training very important. Um, let's at, hear from room two. I think that was Amina and Beatrice. Can you all report out real quick? Sure. Yeah, we had a discussion about um, what is, again, continuing the value of photo voice compared to other qualitative methods. Um, we also talked about um, some of the operational challenges that are present in humanitarian settings and how if an organization needs to already have staffing there or have an understanding of the context like in Syria. 
Um, and then we also talked about the case of Venezuela, about how um, an implementing partner might use the information to um, continue to adapt their program. Great. All right, room three, Portia, Bethany. Sure, I can report out. Um, so one key thing that came up is um, thinking about the enumerators who would, you know, potentially be doing this qualitative data collection and really making sure that both enumerators who are selected have experience with qualitative data collection because that is very different than quantitative methods. Um, make sure that appropriate time is being spent on training. Um, it is a very specialized skill set to be able to, you know, conduct a qualitative interview um, and be able to probe appropriately and um, work through questions appropriately. So make sure there's adequate training time um, and even building in flexibility to be able to, you know, go over more extensively parts of the training um, that might need to be done. And then also, you know, using enumerators as a resource, um, especially if enumerators are from the context in which the participants um, are from be able to, you know, tap into their familiarity with the context, be able to tap into their um, native language skill set if, you know, translated questions don't necessarily always get translated in the same way. So really use them as a resource um, to pilot questions before they actually, you know, go out into the field to make sure that the questions you have are the right and appropriate ones. Yeah, that's a good point. Enumerate is using them as a good resource. All right, um, room number four, I think that was Hannah and Darren, if you all could do a quick report out. We uh, talked about how uh, photo voice could be used. And uh, we thought that um, it, it's really a, an activity in itself, not just a form of data collection uh, that can be used in many ways with uh, lots of different uh, groups. We heard about you know empowering women, give them a voice. Also, uh, children, young children and youth are inclined to take photos and share them, and it, it's a way of uh, sort of lubricating the conversation with them. Uh, we discussed um, settings in education and health, like in in um, one talked about so remedial learning that it's very difficult with kids age uh, grade three. Uh, but combining this with a play methodology, it can be very important. Uh, and um, or in health, like um, the pictures tell a story uh, that helps people to think about how to adopt uh, healthy behaviors, nutritional foods, for example, and, and change their behaviors. Or an example of uh, uh, photos of uh, tippy tap uh, really tell the story of how to use that. So the, the method has been used for some years, but it hasn't been widely used. I think there's a lot of application. Great. Thanks, you, thanks everybody. Um, I know we're way over time right now, probably like 10 minutes over time. So we're going to have to go ahead and wrap it up. Um, thanks, everyone, for this great conversation. And thank you to all the presenters, Amina, Portia, Sophie. We greatly appreciate you taking your time and um, to share your knowledge with our community. It's great to have these sort of exchanges of good practice. And thanks to, you know, Karen, Bethany, Beatrice, Hannah, Everybody who was in the breakout rooms, um, we appreciate you facilitating and note taking for us. And again, thank you to Bella for being our technical lead today. So unfortunately, we're gonna wrap up. As a final request, if we could just ask everybody to click on that link that's um, in the chat. If you could take a quick survey, um, this will help us to sort of, you know, enhance future events and make them better. So if you could take a quick survey on how this event went today. Um, also, if you're interested in joining the Qual Me Peer Community, um, you know, uh, listserv, there's a, a, a way that you can indicate that in the evaluation form. We will be sending out any follow-up uh, follow email with, um, within a few days, we'll try to get an email out with um, materials from today's event and the recording from today's session so you all can re-watch that later on. Um, you can also find resources that are um, around the small grants, uh, the things that the small grants have produced across a range of thematic areas on the FSN website. So there's a link in the chat if you'd like to look a little bit more at um, what some of these small grants are doing. Um, also, please be on the lookout for in the FSN newsletter for our upcoming events. We will be having another event in June around the launching of IDEAL's qualitative toolkit and hopefully this will be a more hands-on workshop 
Um, so look out for the information on this next event on the qualitative toolkit. And thanks again for everybody. Have a great day.